Hey YouTube, I uh, just did an interview with Richard Grove about my book Tragedy and Hope 101. Uh, Tragedy and Hope 101 is essentially a condensed version of Quigley's Tragedy and Hope. Carol Quigley revealed to us uh, as a respected historian how the world actually operates and his book contains a lot of very important information but it's buried between 1300 pages of small text and a lot of people don't have time to read that. So anyway, again, uh, I just did uh, an hour and a half interview with Richard. The interview is going to be a lot more professionally done than what you're about to see. Uh, I filmed on my end with my digital camera. Uh, obviously, the interview itself that Richard is going to produce and release in about two weeks here will be, it'll be a Skype screenshot, better audio, better video, and everything else. This is just kind of a sneak peek so you can get an idea of uh, what my book, Tragedy and Hope 101, is all about and the kind of stuff that is covered in it. Hope you like it. I just wanted to mention a, a couple of the things I noticed at the end of the book, mm -hmm. where in reading through the recommended reading, you mentioned uh, War is a Racket by Major General Smedley Butler, The Law by Frederick Bastiat, Dumbing Us Down by John Taylor Gatto, and The Molecular Vision of Life by Lily Kay, in addition to like 25 other books. Mm -hmm. What do those books all have in common with the Tragedy and Hope 101, your publication? Well, they, they all provide a little bit more insight into how the system actually operates. So obviously Smedley Butler is addressing the uh, military instrument and how it's used to maintain the elite's control. Um, what were the other ones you mentioned? Dumbing us down, obviously John Taylor Gatto would be the education system. Um, molecular vision of life was another one that you mentioned that's boy that's even scarier that's eugenics 2.0 okay all of this is about controlling human beings that's the whole point of the entire system and with the molecular vision of life you're actually getting into uh, the genetic the genetic approach to controlling people on a molecular level what can we do to get into the epigenetic expression of individuals and and manipulate their behavior you know, manipulate their behavior, manipulate their beliefs, manipulate their temperament, and control them. So all of these these books, depending on you know what you might be interested in, all provide additional insight into the uh, the system itself and, and really the mindset of the people who control it. Who do you think your potential audience is? Is who who's this written towards? Who's uh -huh. it written you know to enlighten? Yeah. Who can pick it up and find it useful? I think anybody who wants to pick it up and read it will find it useful. And if this doesn't convince you that the political system is all theater, then I don't know that there's really anything. Because that's the thing, you know, this is the culmination of like over a decade's worth of research. So there's, I don't even want to guess, how many hundreds of books and, and all of this other stuff. And I eventually settled on this one as being, well not my book, but Tragedy and Hope, the Anglo-American Establishment, even with the Evolution of Civilizations, and a few others that I sprinkled in there as providing the most reputable sources to establish this concept of what, you know, where Quigley admits in Tragedy and Hope that the expert will replace the democratic voter in the 20th century. Well, guess what? We're out of the 20th century, and he wrote that back in the 60s. So, that this was the goal, that they, ha that they were creating instruments to do this, to control all habitable portions of the world, and uh, you know, it's um, if this doesn't convince you, then you probably don't want to be convinced, and it isn't going to require a tremendous amount of time and effort for you to get through this information. I mean, the book's probably a if you're a slow reader, it might take you seven hours to get through it. You know, probably average readers five. So it's for anybody who really um, isn't afraid to to face uh, a really ugly truth. Um, so let's let's break it down and, and define some of these aspects. Uh, who was quickly defining as this uh, Anglophile network, in, in your own words? Well, he starts with the creation of the secret society, which is another thing that he, um, I think, did a really great job of imparting, which is the concept of a secret society and the concept of power behind the throne has been around forever and it's just the way things are. We are led to believe it isn't that way, but that is the way it is. Real power is unelected. Real power is unaccountable. That's why it's real power. 
because you don't have control over it. It can do what it wants behind the scenes, and if there's a problem, then the puppets get sacrificed or replaced. But its, its system of control remains intact. Its system of setting policy is there. So he starts, obviously, with um, Cecil Rhodes founding the uh, Secret Society, and then I think the, the most important part of that story is uh, where it all begins, you know, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, the CFR, well, really before that, the inquiry. The inquiry is where it really, in my view, take it, that's where it really truly begins. That's the infiltration of Woodrow Wilson's administration and that whole coup that took place in 1912. And, uh, and then from there you get the CFR and from the CFR you get uh, the, the uh, further infiltration of government to the point where with the War and Peace studies, literally the CFR is basically part of the State Department. Out of that, you get the 1947 uh, National Security Act, and you get the CIA, another fantastic little instrument that they created for their objective. Again, if people can just, if they can step back and they can realize that all of these things were created by people who had a specific goal, then obviously those things were created with the purpose of achieving that specific goal. So if I want to take over the world, or as Quigley s stated, um, well, he was quoting Rhodes, to, to control all habitable portions of the world, then each instrument that I create is going to be created for that purpose. It, it makes no difference what I say it's created for. Of course I'm not going to say that's why I'm creating it. I'm going to create, you know, subterfuge, man. I, I, I don't want you to understand what's going on. But that's, if it, if it was born of this group, then it was created for that purpose. So, that's another really important part of the whole thing as far as I'm concerned is that by going back to that beginning starting point and then following the story you you become aware that the whole mantra of the CIA being about protecting us or the NSA or any of this other stuff who created it do they respect our freedom no they don't at all they resent it they want to undermine it they want complete control so that, I'm not saying there aren't wonderful people in the CIA, and I'm not saying that there aren't wonderful people in the NSA. What I'm saying is, there is meaningless, it would be like saying the government must not be corrupt because Ron Paul was in it. Okay? Yeah, Ron Paul, or the CFR is, can't be that powerful because Angelina Jolie is in it. It's irrelevant. It's ridiculous. Angelina Jolie, the War and Peace studies where the CFR was basically running the State Department, only a tiny handful of the CFR members at that time were even aware of that. So even in that case, even with something as big as that, it was only a select handful of the real power structure within the CFR that was involved in it. So people just kind of need to try to step back and understand all that. I think it's, and once they do that, I think it starts to become, the picture or the intellectual framework for the picture starts to emerge and you can you can start to put it together. Well, I think G. Edward Griffin did a good job of that in the, in the forward in the introduction, and he's spoken in the past about these rings within rings. So really, only the power center of the CFR has anything to do with anything. And those other pieces, you know, some of those people are there just to pay dues and get membership, and some of the people are there for advertising and PR reasons. It's the same reason Angelina Jolie is held up as a you know, trophy by the United Nations yeah. and all that sort of stuff. They're just seeking to subvert individuals through that uh, that, that uh, public relations persona. Even on seemingly opposing sides, you see the sharing of these strategies among the globalists. And whether it's globalism or communism or any of these other isms, what you see is people who are willing to go far beyond the bounds of freedom in order to pillage and plunder the rights and property of other people. And that's a fundamental issue that, that reflects through all of human history, but this is a particularly interesting part because we're living through it. Well, it's it's always been that way. There have always been rulers. For as long as there have been people to rule, there have been people who ruled them. And there is a certain defining characteristic of people who are drawn to those positions of power. They have to possess it. It's like, you know, you're never going to be the heavyweight uh, UFC champion if you're afraid to get hit in the face or you don't want to hit people. 
You're just not going to go there. It's not going to happen. And the same is true for uh, people who are interested in dominating others. It, it, there's it, there's a, a, a personality disorder, shall we call it? Whatever it is, it exists and it's real. And you have to be that type of person. You know, can you imagine, like, I love animals. Animals and music are like, you know, they're, they, they both really bring a lot of joy to my life. Can you imagine somebody who enjoys torturing an animal? Like, can you imagine, like, enjoying taking a puppy and doing, you know, I'm not even going to get into it because it's disgusting, but like some of, like, they, there was that woman who was torturing animals and she YouTubed herself and I think she finally got busted for it. But anyway, the point being, most people cannot imagine that. Most people love animals, and even if they don't love animals, they can't imagine deriving joy and satisfaction from torturing something to death. Okay? But those people exist. Okay? They exist, and we know they exist because there's evidence of it. All right. That's a mindset that's hard for people to imagine. The same is true for them to imagine that their leaders, the people who are at the top of the pyramid, are... Um, they lack the concept of a moral dimension, okay? They, they don't believe in the concept of a moral dimension. There is no moral dimension. All that matters, there is only one law, the law of power. Do you have the ability to do what you want to do or do you not?